Hello Shifters, I'm Vladimir jean -Gil. I'm Axel Nemour. And last week we had the chance to talk to the director of The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened? It's a documentary about the movie Superman Lives and its production. Uh, sadly it never saw the big screen, but it was supposed to be directed by Tim Burton and starring Nicolas Cage, so it was already a pretty huge endeavor. Um, and John went in depth with a lot of the crew members and a few of the actors as to why it never happened and essentially what happened in the production. Yeah, so John Schnepp is the one who directed this documentary and he managed to go in depth uh, and to explore the details as to why and how this movie actually never saw the light of day. So without further ado, let's just listen to what he had to say about that. Being a comic book fan, you know, I had seen, you know, pretty much all the superhero movies that had come out over the last like 15 years, 15, 20 years. And, uh, you know, Superman for the quest for peace just didn't do it for me. So, you know, cut to 17 years later, uh, you know, Superman Returns came out. And I remember just, you know, uh, just not really uh, being into it. I was kind of bored. I fell asleep in the theater and I, I was like, it's a cool homage to the Richard Donner Superman films, but it wasn't what I wanted. I wanted something new since I had waited so long. That's mm -hmm. kind of what I felt. And that reminded me of... of uh, the Tim Burton attempt at Superman. I remember seeing some of the artwork, and it looked very much more science fictiony. Yeah, it did. Kind of cool, cool look to it. Some of the production design, and uh, it just made me kind of start looking through the internet, uh, just searching Superman Lives concept art, and uh, a whole bunch of people were over the course of from 2001 or two all the way up through you know 2012 when I decided to do the documentary. We're releasing little bits and pieces online, either on their Facebook page or on YouTube. So um, I ended up in 2012, and I just had been keeping my own little folder on my desktop, you know, at home and at work. At work. You know, every once in a while I'd do a search for the concept art, and just some new image would show up mm -hmm. that looked cool to me. Um, I'll be totally weird or different, but it was like, wow, that would have been a different Superman film. So mm -hmm. I ended up meeting uh, Steve Johnson, who built all the light-up suits for the regeneration scene of Superman, but a lot of people thought that was what the Superman suit was actually going to look like. Yeah. Um, and I ended up meeting him at a, a D. Antwerd uh, music video screening at Meltdown Comics, and uh, afterwards, uh, me and uh, my uh, fiance, uh, who ended up becoming a producer on the film with me, um, uh, we all went over to uh, this uh, restaurant called Toy and I had dinner with a bunch of friends, and I kind of recounted uh, meeting this guy, Steve Johnson, and then telling him about, you know, I'd been doing all this research and finding images. Then one one of my friends said, you should make a documentary about it. That sounds fantastic. And I said, I don't make documentaries. <laughs> you know, <laughs> at that time, I'd literally been just directing cartoon shows, animated, and uh, I'd also been directing a few live action things. So it was not, documentary was really not in my right, yeah. wheelhouse. And, uh, And then someone else suggested, because I had just run a successful Kickstarter the year before to produce an animated short, and I raised like a, a, a big chunk of money. They were like, why don't you do it on Kickstarter? You, could, you know? And I was like, nah, I don't want to do that. And literally, over the next two months, this is in late 2012, I just, the idea wouldn't leave me alone. And I was like, no one's going to make this. No one's ever going to make a documentary about this. I'm, I, I'll do it. I'll, I would do a good job at it. So I figured, you know what? Why not try it? Try raising the money on Kickstarter, and then if uh, it's, it was a good litmus test to find out about you know the interest level. If mm -hmm. there's an interest level on this on this um, idea, then it should it would be worth making. Like if no one cared about it on Kickstarter, then it wouldn't be worth making because it's it's a good uh, you know judge of the of the public interest. Yes, yeah, so, it's, kind of, it's the kind of project um, where you need people to actually be interested into it in order for you to find any success in it. First of all, so. Yeah, so I found out a lot of other people also had the like-minded idea. Like, hey, I was thinking of doing a documentary. I've always been interested in this. So uh, we raised the money. I, having not done a documentary before, asked, I didn't realize, but asked for too little because it ended up taking a lot of time uh, to actually make the doc in both editing and getting the interviews and just, you know, sculpting it into what it finally became. So, um, you know, the trials and tribulations of making that documentary is a whole other documentary, but I don't know yeah. want to make that one. So right. it, was like, it was a it was a really good learning experience. Um, you know, I went broke like five times trying to you know get the thing done the way I wanted to. Yeah. I had the chance to 
sign up with a couple of different uh, companies. Uh, all, in the end run, I ended up distributing it myself as an independent filmmaker. Uh, and I, you know, I'm very happy that I did do everything that I done to make the film. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much the story. So we also got to talk to him about his past projects, uh, including the work he did on Metalocalypse, a uh, very famous dark comedy animated show that uh, was on Adult Swim uh, for quite a number of seasons. The second season of Metalocalypse, and I was like, man, I need a break. But it was like one of those once-in-a-lifetime opportunities that you get, you know. So I was like, you know what, I'll do it. So I went to New York for six months and worked on the first half of uh, the se season four. They split into two seasons, mm -hmm. which was a, another really great learning experience. They do all their animation completely different than the way Metalocalypse. Metalocalypse was done all in-house with all animators like who are like literally right next door to you. And we would have daily sessions and do animation, re redos, all the backgrounds were done in-house. Everything was done in-house and edited in-house and composited in-house. Mm -hmm. But with Venture Brothers, all, everything is done overseas. So it's a whole other, it's a whole other pipeline where everything has to be like the script and the, everything has to be tight. You can't screw around with it. Everything is storyboarded and then it goes through you know, animation directors and the terminology of the of the, what they actually do is so different from like what animation directors did. Yeah. You know, uh, for Metalocalypse, where it's like you had the animation director is basically a timing sheet guy who's like, and then Doctor Venture drinks the coffee and you have to like show where the coffee is exactly <laughs> at frame eleven. So, you know, as a director working on it, it was it was a it was a eye opener for me, and I was like, boy, I don't I don't want to work on a show like this because right, yeah. it's just it removes some of the spontaneity. Mm -hmm. You know, but luckily, I mean, you know, like uh, Doc and, uh, you know, the, the guys who make uh, Venture Brothers, you know, Chris McCullough, those guys are insanely talented, great writers, and they write everything to a T, so that means really tight. Mm -hmm. In fact, they do it on purpose. They were like 48-page scripts. They're like, dude, it has to be in like 23 minutes. So <laughs> So we were also curious to find out about his past as a director, what actually motivates him as a content creator, and here's what he had to share. Well, um, when, I, when I decided to go to a, an art school, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and uh, because you didn't have to declare a major, and I didn't really know what, I, I knew I, I loved drawing comics, I, mm -hmm. I loved painting, I knew, this, so I, I didn't really know, I, I wanted to investigate film and video, and that's what I did at this really creative uh, college in Chicago and uh, I ended up like getting into like doing like um, film video performance art is what I guess they like live theater interactions with video and film and just but it was all comedic it had a comedic edge to it so that's what I ended up doing when I graduated and I do performance kind of things in front of bands and I was you know trying to figure out where, I, where what I what I was going to do once I graduated and mm -hmm. uh, some of my friends were doing music videos and Nine Inch Nails had shot their very first video at my loft at my house. And so I kind of like, just by knowing my, these friends of mine who were doing all these music videos, they're like, you know, hey, you can help me build this prop. Or so I sort of PA'd for them for like the first year or so. And then I started acting in all these videos. So I'm like in an Ozzy Osbourne video, I'm in an Iron Maiden video. That's like a crazy because I'm a big, tall, weird looking dude. I'm a mad scientist. Get that guy to, you know. Yeah. Because I knew how to act. I was like, yeah, I can be a crazy freak or something. So it was really fun. Those first few, you know, first early years of my 20s, kind of, uh, you know, acting and building props and working in, uh, in a lot of music videos. And that, that in turn, ended up opening up uh, a lot of avenues of like, uh, I wrote my own science fiction comedy series with a friend of mine and we ended up producing it at this music video uh, shop. What was it, what was it called? Family, we use, it's called Mad Okay. I've never released it. I'm okay. planning on releasing it maybe at the end of this year because it'll make it the 25th anniversary. So it's okay. kind of like, we actually shot three episodes and it's got, you know, it's like a who's who of like people who are famous now who nobody knew who they were back then. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's got a bunch of upright, upright citizen brigade in it. That'd be cool to see. That'd be cool. It's got, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it kind of holds up. It's like the effects are definitely like, that was made in 19, you know, 93. You know? <laughs> yeah. It definitely... Club Dead, 
And uh, so I ended up doing that as well as editing it because I learned how to edit on an Avid back then. It was like one of the first 100 Avids that got made. Um, of so John Seth is also a content creator, he's also a comic book fan, and he was also able to explain to us the challenges that he had to go through when he made this film. He also took the time to explore the challenges that most comic book artists and most comic book uh, creators have to face and have to go through in order for their, for their work to be put out there. So here's what he had to share about this. Like my film, The Death Two Man Lives, was torrented over 400,000 times. What? And that's money that died, was stolen from me. Yeah. It was it was beating out San Andreas and Minions when it first came out. Uh, when it, when I premiered it July 9th at Comic Con, mm -hmm. that people is were like insane. emailing me, "Dude, you've made it!" Because it was being downloaded so many times. But unfortunately, the masses don't realize. Like I'm not, you know, a big giant company. They're just basically stealing money from me and yeah. money that I need to make back to pay back other people. You know that I was in debt making this film. You know, I I raised money on Kickstarter and another another crowdfunding source. I still end up having to get another $150,000 to finish the film properly. So, you know, filmmaking in general is not cheap if you're doing all the things that, you know, people are, you know, expect of you, like getting a good sound mix, making color correction, getting, rising the level of professionalism to, you know, where you want it to be. And also just being able to spend the right amount of time in editing and getting the film done. Those are the things where, you know, the costs come in. Um, and, and yet at the same time, I mean, there's some people you could read online like, hey, it's a 3.3% 3, 3, 3 rise in comic book stores, but that's in, it's an inflated way of looking at it. It's like comic book stores have been closing like for 20 years now, like it's shuttering, it's going from like 7,000 to 5,000 to 4,000 to 2,000. So you're like, how many stores are left and how long are they going to be able to hold out by selling variant covers and selling chase comic books and you know, selling slab CGC comics that nobody's reading. I mean, that's not what comic books, that's not what reading is about. That's not what, so it's a, literally, it's, it's become this like kind of snake eating its own tail thing. I, I really want to find out what we can do to open that back up and open back, open up the creativity of what comic books are. The whole reason we have this like renaissance of superhero films is because people are allowed to make new characters. People, they, they and that's not, that, at least with the bigger companies, we see a regurgitation of all the same characters and the same stories. Mm. So that kind of growth is not happening, and that's going to kill comics. So, wow. you know, in my own mind, I want, to, I want to try to find out who's got the right idea as to what the next level is. A lot of people keep pushing digital, but unfortunately, until, you, until they've figured out a way to lock, you know, people torrenting comic books, where it's just like movies, just like music, just like TV shows, comics are being illegally torrented and people just get it for free and they're not thinking about what that's doing to the entire economy of what why do you think you get a movie for free well yeah of course a ton of people mm -hmm. you know were like ah it's you know a fan film that guy nods a lot you know a lot of people like to you know, point that out or you know, there's certain there's certain criticism of the film, but really, you know, it's minor to me. I right. mean, I was very happy with it, and I did what I accomplished with what I wanted to accomplish with the film. Mm -hmm. I mean, my only my only uh, wish that I couldn't get was uh, to actually interview Nicolas Cage. But you know, even after we finished the film, I realized that wasn't important. I mean, we have footage of Nicolas Cage and Tim Burton talking about Superman back when they were making it when yeah. Super, when Nicolas Cage dressed as Clark Kent. Nicholas Cage dressed as different versions of Superman and then exchanging ideas, him exchanging ideas with Tim Burton. That is so we also got to hear a little bit about his future projects and what he has in store over the next couple of years, and uh, here's what he had to say. Um, that I can tell you about, uh, yes, I can tell you, I am actually, I'm working on two proof of concept uh, pieces for two feature films. One is a science fiction film and one is a horror film. Okay. And the company is is helping fund that so that we can raise uh, the money to make both of those films. So I'm going to be shooting those, I think, in June. Which leads into, I just started a new Kickstarter just two days ago, so that's my next feature film. Mm -hmm. It's a documentary feature film called Sweaties Unite, Rise of the Uber Nerd. If you go to Kickstarter and just type in Sweaties Unite or type my name in, you'll see it. And oh, I just started it a couple days ago, and I'm asking for, you know, a little over, you know, like about 175 grand, really, literally. It's like, I know that sounds like a lot of money,
money, but since I did the Superman thing and had to mm. go back and ask for more money, I know how much everything costs. So all the, you know, the entire budget is written down. And it's literally to do, do this documentary right. It's about the rise of comic book feature films and how those kinds of kind of taken over the, the box office as yeah, well as so. television. There's like 11 superhero films. There's like six superhero movies coming out. Yeah, yeah just this year, yeah. yeah. So we definitely think you should check out The Death of Superman Lives What Happened if you have any interest in it at all. Uh, it's absolutely worth watching. It's really interesting to see uh, all the different perspectives from both uh, cast and crew uh, as to, well, what happened, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, thank you for watching. Don't forget to check out The Death of Superman Lives What Happened. We have a link in the description box down below so you can check it out. And again, that was Vladimir for Shift On Films. And I'm Axel Nermoor. Thanks a lot for watching. Take care. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I want to thank my entire team, like my producer that produced it with me, Holly Payne, my editor, Marie Hamora, who edited the film with me, my compositor, uh, Chris Grable. I mean, we have a very, we had a very small team, yeah. you know? I mean, we had the executive producer, Rob Pierce, and then a few other people, literally, like maybe six other people, but it was a core crew of, of you know, of us who worked on it for like a good two years.